Eight. Hello and welcome to Chapter Five Homework with your hostess Moses, Professor Naragon. We're going to dive into probability. Yes, at the probability you're going to pass this homework while watching this video will raise. Will be a hundred percent. I hope so. <laughs> okay. Let's go ahead and start with question number one. All right. So we have a survey of 33 students at the Wall College of Business showing the following majors. We got accounting at nine, finance at four, economics at three, management at eight, and marketing at nine. From the 33 students, suppose you randomly select a student. What is the probability he or she is a management major. So we're basically looking at the total number of students and we'll just want to know how many are going to be management. And also we need to round to the nearest three decimal places. Well, for this probability question, we always going to need our calculators on these. So calculators on. We're going to take the number of management majors that we can pick divided by the total number of students. Or basically, I mean, all the outcomes we can have. And we found out that it's 0.24 repeated, but we round to the nearest three decimal places. So 2, 4, 2. Because again, 4 is below 5. So we round down. So our answer will be 0 0.242. Check. And the answer is complete and correct. Only little item that we have that we have to deal with math. Now, you do have this question B. Don't forget about this. If we scroll down just in case there's another part of the question. Here with question B, all you're going to do is answer uh, which concept of probability did you use to make this estimate? Will it be empirical, randomness, uniformity, inference, or classical? Well, here's a big hint. We really only talked about two of these, so take it as you will. Uh, unfortunately, since it is a multiple choice answer, I cannot give you the answer on that one. Next, we have a sample of 47 oil industry executives was selected to test a questionnaire. One question about environment issues required a yes or no answer. What is this experiment? So again, it's the survey of blank people about environment issues. Well, let's see. Because that is our survey. So however many oil industry executives that we have. For me, it was 47. For you, maybe something else. Let's return. B. Which of the following are possible events that you can have here? You may select more than one answer. Single click the box with the question mark to produce a check mark. So forth and so on. Well, we definitely know anything below R47, or whatever, how many old industries you got, can happen. We can have those. We can't have someone have it higher. And it is very doubtful that the questionnaire fails to reach one executive. And they will not tell you if that's correct or not. But can that be a possibility? Mm. 
So they were all selected to test a questionnaire. One question about is it possible? Honestly, it could be a possibility there too. Fails to reach one executive. It's a very unlikely possibility, but can it happen? Yes. So we can probably check that one. Probably is going to be right as well. We just can't have 53 people respond no if we only have 47. All right. C. 22 of the 47 executives responded yes. Based on the sample response, what is the probability that an old industry executive will respond yes? Well, this is just like question one. Well, we take our calculator. We take how many executives that actually responded yes and divide it by our total number of executives. So, and this is round your answer to two decimal places. So here, sometimes you got to remember, I got to make it bigger. So I got 0.468. So that 8, since it's higher than 5, means we round up. So we're going to go 0.47. So nearly 50%. Funny part is that it's 47. We have 47 executives. Who knew that was going to happen? <laughs> and then the other two, again, are multiple choice. One has the concept probability used. And the other one is, are each of the possible outcomes equally likely and mutually exclusive? Okay. All right. Question three. The events X and Y are mutually exclusive. Suppose PX, uh, probability of X, equals 0.1 and the probability of Y equals 0.09. What is the probability of either X or Y occurring? So, this is our addition that we got going on. So, the property of either X or Y. So that we would basically would just add the two. It's really the only probability that we've got going on. So I want to say 0.19. There we go. Because I mean that's the only probability I've got if we're trying to find either or. I mean it's just as the simple addition that we have going on. Now, what would happen if neither X or Y happens? Well, if we know the sum is 0.19, all we have to do is take our calculator, take 1 minus 0.19, shows us that most likely neither is going to happen because it's a higher probability close to the one, <laughs> neither one's going to get picked at 0.81. But this one, this one's a simple addition one that we had going on. And then, of course, we have the substitution one, that rule. So not terribly, terribly bad. Not getting really complicated. Again, probability... It's not one of the hardest ones. Again, it's just formulas. Formulas, formulas, formulas. All right. So a student has taken two courses, history and math. The probability that the student will pass the history course is 0.58. And the probability of him passing the math course is 0.67. Well, at least say he's above 50% on each one. He's on the path. But, oh, hopefully y'all got better percentages on yours. All right. The probability of passing both is 0 0.40. Okay. So what is the probability of passing at least one of these classes? All right. So 
So for this one, I think we may have to use the general rule of addition. Because we do have an and. We have something that's not mutually exclusive. So, with that being said, in order to do the general exclusive, we're going to take our calculator. We're going to take the probability of passing the history course, 0.58, plus the probability of passing the math course, minus the probability of passing both. So we're looking at a 0.85 probability okay so again general rule of addition end up happening right here where we have something that's not mutually exclusive and we must take out the probability of the, him probably passing both but that's a good probability I mean 85% probability that he can pass both I mean not both uh, at least one yeah but we do want him to pass both Come on. Come on. I know all y'all do. So, but uh, sometimes those questions hit hard for professors. We want y'all to always succeed. All right, question five. All Seasons Plumbing has two service trucks that frequently need repair. That is not good. <laughs> If the probability of the first truck is available is 0.71, the probability of the second truck is available 0.56, and the probability of both trucks are available at 0.42, what is the probability neither truck is available? Ooh. So this one kind of throws in that fun little <laughs> I got your moment here. So, we got to do the general rule of addition with this, plus the complementary rule. Because we got to find the neither. So, let's do the general rule first. Remember the general rule? We're going to add the two trucks, that individually. So, 0 0.71 plus 0.56. Then subtract when we have probably both available. So that gives us what 0.85. Now, the probability that both trucks are not available. We have to take 1 minus 0.85. That gives us our remaining of 0.15%. 15%. So we're looking at 15% of the time, or a probability, that neither truck is available. But man, if they're breaking down that much, dudes, y'all need to get a new truck. <laughs> Not good for business. All right, so solve the following. Oh, we've got some fun stuff going on right here. So we got two factoring, and it looks like just really different types of factoring going on. Factorials. Nice. Might as well give y'all some <laughs> more math. All right. So how does this work? Well, first off, 24 factorial divided by 20 factorial. We can put that in the calculator. Let's put that in the calculator. All right. 21 divided by oh wait why am I doing 21 <laughs> I don't know where 21 came from <laughs> sorry guys All right clear alright so 24 factorial which is a huge number divided by Oh, 
uh, what was it, 20 factorial equals basically 255. Now, easiest way to do this, if you actually wrote it all out, you can actually cancel out things. But if the calculator is there, use the calculator. Use the tools at your disposal. 255024. 255024. Okay. Now, this 10P7 and 8C7, these are two items that we have not yet really discussed uh, when it comes to. Um, factorials so I'm not totally expecting y'all to be able to be masters of these but in order to do this which each of them have their own little thing amazingly <laughs> P is different than C we're going to take first we have to figure out our denominator Okay, which is for B, it's 10 minus 7. So it's the first number minus the second one when there's a P. So 10 minus 7 equals to 3. And then we need to find the factorial of 3, which is 6. Yeah, 3 times 2 times 1. Okay, then we take. 10 factorial divided by 6. Because that was 3 factorial. It goes to 604, 800. Okay. Now, when you see the C right there, different way of factorial. Okay, so with this being said, in order to do this factorial, again, we need to find the denominator. We're going to divide 2, just like we did with A, but now we got to do it a little bit different. Okay, so first off, we have still have to take the two numbers, so 8 minus 7, which is 1, and 1 factorial is 1. Not negative, but basically 1 times 1, which for me, this makes it easier. For y'all, it may be a little bit harder. But basically, we take 1, multiply 1 factorial for me, 7 factorial, which is the second number. Okay, so that's our denominator, 5,040. From there, we take, again, the first number, factorial, and divide it by what we figured out for the denominator, and it's going to be 8. Okay, so a little bit more complicated with C and B. We haven't talked about those in the lecture, so if you do have questions on those, please let me know. Uh, I do not worry about answering those for y'all to help y'all guys out. Next, question seven. Okay, we have four women's college basketball teams are participating in a single elimination holiday basketball tournament. If one team is favored in its semifinal match by the odds of 1.35 to 1.65, and another squad is favored in in its contest by odds of 2.90 to 1.10. What is the probability that both favorite teams win their games? All right. So we know already we have four. So when it gives us a range, again, we want to take the highest number. Right. 
Now, the thing that we also have to watch out is the wording. Okay? Now, when it talks about one squad is favored in its contest by odds of 2.90 and 1.10, that still means that there's four teams. A semifinal match that could be meaning something else. It could be mean that three teams. Okay, that's a little, it's a little bit funny how they put that special rule in for a multiplication going on here. Would have probably chilled into something else or have more teams. Anyway, to figure this out. We're going to take our calculator, again take the highest, divide it by how many teams in that particular one. We want to know how many teams will win that contest, which is four, and we're going to multiply it by the one from the next round. I'm going to put it in parentheses, they have 1.65 as highest, divide by three teams. That can be left. Okay. Basically, they made it to the next round. So our probability is 0.39875. Again, we got around two decimal places. So it'll be 0.40. Oh. oh. Something's up here. Let me see. We have a rounding issue going on. I wonder. Let's look at the calculator. Let's see if they're going for. Usually it's going to be for the highest. But maybe they're going to take the first one. Point three three. Because now I gotta figure out. Yeah. All right. All right. So they're trying not. They stated as a different way. They're not doing it as a range. Which mostly looks like a range. That's why I got caught off. Basically, that's the numbers of the two teams in that match. So 1.35 is there to their opponents, 1.65. That's a little tricky there. But either way, so take the first number of each, not the highest. And again, with the semifinal match, you're going to divide by three. With the contest on the, another squad one, that one is divided by four. How about neither favored team is going to win its game? Okay, so since this is the opposite, we, we cannot do the subtraction. Don't do the subtraction part. We have to do the second number, the opponent's number. So again, 1.65 for the semifinal, divide by three. And we're going to multiply it by the 1.10 divided by 4. So we're left with 0.15125 and it wants four decimal places here. So 0.1512. Turn the question. My bad. <laughs> Point one five one two. Oh, three. There we go. Had to do that rounding up. Check. There we go. Okay. Now we're back on track. All right. 
turn question. Question C. At least one of the favorite teams wins this game. Okay. So. So basically, if we have neither favorite team win its games, and we want at least one favorite team to win, we can basically, for this one, pick one minus our last answer. Again, four decimal places. So, eight, four, eight, seven. I like how they even did it by four decimal places just to kind of like go, oh yeah. I did four decimal places here. I only did two here. But yes, that's a complimentary one because at least one has to win. Here, none of them win. So that will be exactly the one minus right here. Okay, that was fun. We've learned wording in problems that we always have to watch out for. Question eight. There are 21 families living in Rillbrook Farms Development. Of these families, 14 prepare their own federal income tax. Okay. For the last year, 8 had their taxes prepared by a local professional. Woohoo! And the remaining 1 by H&R Block. Wow. I feel like that's a stab to H&R Block there with only 1. That's okay. H&R Block. But, um... Wherever y'all go to do your taxes, is your own thing. As a tax count, I love it when they finally bring in taxes. Don't even care what it's about. It's got taxes in it. So, what is the probability of a selected family that prepares their own taxes? Okay. Well, we have 14 that prepare their own taxes. So, 14 out of 21 is going to be our probability. 14 divided by 21, which is 0.6. 6 forever. So, round to two decimal points, we mean 0.67. We kind of knew that was going to happen. All right. B, what is the probability of selecting two families both of which prepare their own taxes. Okay, so we almost got two times one here. So what is the probability of selecting two families? Now, first off, there, this is conditional stuff. We know the first selection is again 14 divided by 21. All right. So, we're going to have to multiply. Again, our multiplication rules. So, to pick another family that has been doing their own taxes. Well, we've already picked one. So, the probability of selecting in consecutive means... We only have 13 now left out of 20 families. So that means our probability of doing both of these events together, selecting two, is 0.43. Oh, round four to four places. Add a couple more threes. <laughs> For me, at least. Okay? Because again, we're starting to drop down. And why not? C goes, let's do a third one. Okay. So again, we're going to just go ahead and multiply what we got since it's already in the calculator. We're going to the next step. So that means we're left with 12 families divided by 19. So 0.2737. Okay, last one. 
What is the probability of selecting two families, neither of which had their taxes prepared by H&R Block? So we have 14 plus 8. Uh, is that really it? 14 plus 8? So we have 22 families doing their math. So 14 prepared, 8, and the remaining 1 by H&R Block. So we were to select 1 that did not. What is the problem with selecting 2 families, neither of which had taxes prepared by H&R Block? Well, basically we have this 21 divided by 21. We could literally pick, since we have more families that probably did other things. Probability of actually selecting one, 21 divided by 21. And then multiply one by basically the probability of selecting our second family could be 20 by 20. So we're really at probability of one. That's a funny one. <laughs> I would say that. Because we only really, we have more families to have prepared than what we actually have our sample size in. That, sometimes I wonder. I wonder what, what questions they pick. <laughs> All right, so that's question B. Let's do the last question together, okay? Again, your numbers are gonna be different, but as long as you're understanding how you're doing things, that's the best part. Okay. So we have a company that uses two backup servers to secure its data. The probability that the servers fail is 0.21. Assume that the failure of servers is independent of other servers. What is the probability that one or more of the servers is operational. Okay, so we got two backups. So since we got two, basically 0.21 times 0.21, and we're looking at possibility that both of these could fail. At the same time, is what is most likely one is going to be working. So when we look at this, first off, let's take our calculator. 0.21 times 0.21. You can do 0.21 squared if you want to, if you got one of these calculators. Comes out to the same thing. So 1 minus 0 0.0441. Tell me the probability of that happening is 0.9559. And we gotta add a couple of zeros. So it says round answer to six decimal places. But really, there is not much uh, going on there. They're just trying to catch you. But saying two, and that fails at 0.21. So we want to find the opposite. Basically, having at least one working. So check. Boom. And there we go. And that's it. That's chapter five. All done and wrapped up with a nice little bow. So again, if you have any questions, please let me know. And by that, I wish you all do. Until the next awesome video for stats comes out.